Okay, continuing with Romans 1 here. Um, and in the last message, we talked about... I'm going to try to get through the end of chapters 1 here. Um, but the last message, we talked about how the gospel is the revelation of the righteousness of God. It's just interesting that um, that's so powerful. We don't think of it like that. We think of the righteousness of God as revealed in the law. And I've talked about this enough. I'm not going to belabor the point. But the gospel of Christ is, number one, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And number two, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. On the one hand, it's revealed in God's record concerning his son and what he accomplished in his death and resurrection and how he dealt with our sins righteously. And we'll see more of that in Romans 3. Uh, God himself is on trial. It's not just that we're on trial. We think of the courtroom as we're the ones being judged. But as we'll, when we get to Romans 3, we'll see that actually God himself is being vindicated. It's his own righteousness that's being put on display and vindicated. That righteousness is the foundation of his throne. It's the foundation of the kingdom, and it's the foundation for our trust. For the ages to come, we will know that everything rests on absolute righteousness. There will never be another question again. There won't be a rebellion again after the new heavens and the earth, new earth, not only because we will have all been recreated and will be holy and righteous as God is righteous, but the questions will have been answered. We'll never wonder. We, it, this history that we're going through for the last 6,000 years has thoroughly explored all the different ways it could have been done, all the different kinds of kingdoms that could have been established, a mix of having God on the throne and yet man being still sinful and mortal or having God be invisible and yet have human kings and laws uh, and then human forms of governments. You know, the 20th century was the age of experiment where everybody got to try their utopia and every single one of them ended up killing millions of people. You know, Mao, Stalin, Hitler. Uh, and we'll, we will never question again because God's answer is Christ and the gospel and the work of Christ. All righteousness has been fulfilled in him, okay? And then that righteousness is manifested on us who believe as we live by faith. And we're vindicated before God. We're vindicated before the law. We're vindicated before accusation. But also the Christ who is the righteousness of God now indwells us. And we our living by faith is not just a belief that we were forgiven, but that we've been identified with Christ. We've been crucified with him, and he lives in us. And living by faith is the key to having the righteousness of the law fulfilled in those who believe, who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. And we'll get into all that. You know, I'm kind of I'm kind of jumping ahead, but the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, which is the description of what God has done for us in Christ and who Christ is in us. Okay, um, and then, <clears throat> for the wrath of God is revealed, I'll just read this, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Because when they knew not when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God unto an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up 
to vile affections, even their women exchanging the natural use of that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women, burning their lust towards one another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of error, which was meat. Hold on. Sorry, I got interrupted and I'm not sure where I left off. Uh, I'll just continue at 28. Um, and then, even when they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murders, disabate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they who commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them. Oh my gosh. This is like the most horrendous passage in scripture. And I know people who won't read the book of Romans because they've read chapter one and think that it's just bad news all the way through. And you go, no, Romans is the best book. It's the one that'll set you free. Oh yeah. No, I can't read that book. You know, it's so, ah, oh, the words they use is so too much, you know, and, uh, this is where that comes from, you know, um, now, first of all, let's talk about this, though. Uh, the wrath of God. You know, when we hear the word wrath of God, we think of our human nature, which, as I said, is stained, has, or as I have said, is stained with sin. And anything we manifest, like everything God manifests is perfectly pure, holy, with all of his virtues are intact. I don't know how to say it other than to say that he is, we, we know that his main virtues are holiness, light, love, and righteousness. And uh, these are based on, uh, the, the mystics used to talk about this, but it's based on any, it's, it is based on what the scripture reveals are his most essential Things. We know God is love, and we know God is light, and we know God is holy, and we know God is righteous. There's things that God does, but the, and there's things that God has, but then there's things that the scripture says that God is. God is righteous. God is love. God is holy, and God is righteous. And whatever he does is in accordance with his own nature. His own nature is being vindicated. That's why I say it's important to understand that Jesus didn't just fulfill a law as if God, somebody wrote something down and then Jesus went and did it and therefore fulfilled that thing. No, Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the son of God. He is the divine life. He is the eternal life. And that life is righteous. That life is love. That life is holy. That life is... Um, pure at light in all everything that he does and everything that he has that comes out from him is going to be of that fourfold nature including his wrath see when we think of wrath we think of just unrestrained anger where you're out of control and you've really lost it this time you got so mad that you just exploded and then out of your wrath comes all kinds of vile, vile, and violence and vileness, right? That's not the case with God. Everything God does has love, righteousness, holiness, and light as its ingredients. Even his wrath. So God doesn't just, act, he's not store, he is storing up his wrath, and, and there will be people that, you know, we'll drink of the cup of his wrath poured out without mixture, right? But he is righteous and he does as he does this. And his love. See, what I, I've learned to see in Romans 1, this looks all so awful as we talk through it, but why does he let men go so low? It says he delivered them over to these terrible things, right? Well, it's because they... 
are puffed up in their pride. And it is only through debasement that, and humiliation that they'll ever come to an end of themselves so that there might be some hope that they would be saved. What God desires, genuinely, that everyone be saved. His righteousness is revealed in the gospel. Goodwill towards men uh, and peace, right? And God's intention is that as many people as possible would be saved. But men really did genuinely fall, right? And so the wrath is measured out. It is revealed from heaven. The righteousness is revealed in the gospel. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness who of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So they know the truth, but they suppress it. Another translation says they suppress it in unrighteousness. So they can sense the, right, the, the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel and the wrath of God. And the wrath is against those who don't believe the gospel, okay? And they are eventually going to be manifest in their actions as worthy of wrath. Um, and this is for a purpose. God is not just doing this out of anger because he hates you or something like that. No, he is, everything is a tr teaching. Everything is a training. Everything is... And everything is motivated by love in the hope that some would come to their senses, like the prodigal son. You know, the prodigal son was delivered over in a sense. Be, you know, he went down to waste his inheritance on riotous living, but before you knew it, he was delivered over and he was working for a pig farmer and he, and he was like begging for pig slop and then saying, gosh, it'd be, if only I could even just be a servant in my father's house, it would be better than this. So what? He came to his senses, the scripture says. It is possible to come to your senses, but sometimes you have to bottom out. And an AA person knows this. You have to bottom out. You know, sometimes you have to wait for people to drown. And not only that, but it'd be better if they drowned a little faster. <laughs> and, you know, there's that example of the lifeguard who's, he, there's a guy standing by the lifeguard and there's somebody drowning out in the lake. He's like, why won't you go save him? He's like, because he's still kicking. As long as he's kicking, if I go try to save him, he'll just pull me down with him. I have to wait till he's exhausted. I have to wait till he's spent and starting to sink. And then I can go grab his limp body and drag him in and it'll be safe. And I can really save him. Okay. That's kind of what's working here from what I understand. Um, and someone may disagree with me, but if you see the wrath of God, Please understand that this is God, and God is love, God is light, God is holiness, and God is righteousness. And his righteousness is revealed in the gospel, and his light is revealed in the Son, and his holiness is revealed in the blood of Jesus that was offered up to sprinkle us. And his uh, righteousness is vindicated in that he can pass over our sins righteously and forgive us. Um, because of the work of Christ. It all comes together in Christ. You have to look at God in the person of Jesus Christ if you're going to know him. You can't know, in fact, Jesus said, no one can know the Father. No one's ever seen the Father except the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father has revealed him. God is a mystery. He's a consuming fire and he dwells in inapproachable light and you can't get close to him except in the person of Jesus Christ. And he became a man so that we could understand what the Father is like. When you see me, you've seen the Father. And can you imagine Jesus exploding with wrath out of control? He's finally so pissed off he can't take it anymore. And he just, he just cusses you out. <laughs> now he's going to come in his wrath. And he is going to have the blood-stained garments. His garments will be soiled with the blood of his enemies. But that will be the end of an age where all the transgressions have reached their full. And people have been given every, ab absolutely every opportunity under every circumstance to repent and believe the gospel. And they won't because of the hardness of their heart. And it will grieve God and he'll have to wipe the tears off of people's faces after Jesus accomplishes that great work, that strange work, you know, when he executes judgment. But even that will be 
uh, according to his nature, not out of character. So just keep in mind when you see the wrath of God, please temper it with the person of Jesus and the wrath. I'm not talking about universalism. I don't believe everybody's going to get saved. I believe the wrath of God really is revealed against unrighteousness and ungodliness and that we are heirs of wrath by nature when we get born uh, when we get born into this world and once our conscience starts functioning especially because then we start suppressing the truth you know a functioning conscience and an unbeliever is just uh another way for them to lie to themselves you know their conscience accuses them and then their mind develops lies to suppress the voice of that conscience and justify themselves, apart from the justification that only Christ can provide. They want a righteousness, but they don't want God's righteousness. They don't want blood, they don't want the gospel, they don't want Jesus Christ. Anyway, they are holding the truth in unrighteousness, and the wrath of God is revealed in heaven because um, against them, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. See, when you preach the gospel to someone, and we forget this, we often come from the weak standpoint of thinking we have to convince them of something that they don't know. And we have to bring all this information to them that they don't know. If we, It would be more powerful if we understood that they do know, and that what we need to do is awaken their conscience to what they actually already know, and then we can speak to that which already registers as true in them. See? There's already a body of knowledge in mankind innately. They know there's a judgment to come. They know that the wrath of God is revealed against uh, the ungodly and the unrighteous who do certain things. They know that God is real, but they deny it through unrighteousness and suppressing the truth. Okay, And then they know that the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, they're without excuse. They see the oceans, they see the mountains, they see the design in this universe, and they know, instinctively, they know that it was created by a being that, you know, mountains and rivers and oceans and vastness and space, that is, the reason God gave us such a big seeming universe is so that we could understand the dimensions of his virtues. He is, you know, his love is higher than the heavens, when it talks about that kind of stuff, as far as the east is from the west, he's removed his, our sins from us. Uh, his mercy is deeper than the mountains. His thoughts towards us are more than the sand of the seashore. On the one hand, that's colorful language, poetic. On the other hand, those dimensions are probably accurate, that he really does have more thoughts towards you than there are sands on the seashore. And he wants you to understand the vastness of his uh, being and his thought towards you and his love towards you. And he's given you a universe of scale so that you have comparisons. So, you know, if we didn't have a universe, we couldn't understand scale. If he had just created us as a more uh, as like blobs of light in a in a universe that has no space and no time and no matter and nothing to define anything. Nothing was defined. It was just a light bulb, a light orb or something like that. It would be very difficult for him to communicate to us in terms of scale. Scale is a great way to communicate. It, try to think of like, we, we, we measure things. We are designed to measure things. By observation. And that's the kind of, we're a being that lives in a three-dimensional universe where we actually look around and we see that's big and that's small. That's bigger than that. And that's larger than that. That's wider than that. That's longer than that. That's higher than that. You know, we know how to measure because of the universe we live in. And that universe is given so that we can understand comparisons that give us a glimpse of the glory of God. So that's, how I see the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. His eternal power and Godhead are revealed. And I look at it as the God's virtues are full in the scriptures that are full of comparisons of scale for us to understand the depths of his love and his mercy and his righteousness. How could we understand those things if he didn't give, you know, in terms of depth? We understand the language of scale because of the universe he gave us to live in. And so he can speak of his great love 
if we were just in a in an orb of light with no dimensions if he said great love or small love it wouldn't mean anything to us right but now he can say his love is higher than the heavens everlasting love well we understand time time is slow and long and his love is everlasting see that's a scale comparison and that helps us to know the dimensions of his love so that he can really fill it in with detail for us and make it three-dimensional for us uh just a tangent but i like it um and that's what i think about in verse 20 but then these people they know all this but they're suppressing that or not they we before we're saved we were the same people because that when they knew god see they know god but they glorify him not as god and weren't thankful that is the root you know the first response to having a universe is to be thankful i'm thankful you know i watch my kid play minecraft and he's got too many chickens in his little house he's got this house and he spawned all these chickens and he's got a turtle room and he's got uh he's got <laughs> He's got a turtle room, he's got a chicken room, he's got a bunch of sheep, and he's got all these animals wandering around this house he made in Minecraft. And you know what it does? The processing power for the CPU, for the computer, to simulate all this is making it slow and jittery. So that as he walks around, it's really laggy. I'm like, you got to create a new universe because this one is so full of things that the computer has to keep track of that it's completely bogged down. Aren't you glad you live in a universe that doesn't stutter when you walk or look to the left and have lag and latency? <laughs> it, some of the older people might not know what I'm talking about. Um, sorry, it's a video game reference, but we live in this smooth universe where everything works in a wonderful way, and we should be thankful. That is what God would like to restore us to, is the, and that's the fruit of the gospel is thanksgiving. Um but instead of being thankful, they became what puffed up, vain in their imaginations, and then their foolish heart was darkened. And that darkening of the heart alienates people from the life of God. And then they get delivered over to uh, working all uncleanness with greediness, greediness because they are beyond feeling. That's what it says in Ephesians 4, is they lose their capacity to feel the sense of their conscience the conscience is God's light shining on you, and everyone has one. And that is how we intuitively know that the universe is real, and that it was created, and that God is real, and that there's wrath against unrighteousness, and that there's a judgment that's to come, because our conscience excuses and accuses us. But when our mind is puffed up, and our heart becomes darkened, that light dims and we no longer feel our conscience we're beyond feeling or without feeling and then we go after uncleanness with greediness is what it says in ephesians 4 so it says don't walk as the gentiles do in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened and they're because they're alienated from the life of god and they've gone beyond feeling meaning their conscience is no longer functioning and now they're going after all kinds of uncleanness with greed okay and that's basically the same thing here that they become vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart darkened and they profess themselves to be wise right they come up with all these philosophies to explain the universe oh it exploded out of nothing yet and then it it just actually appeared you know out of nothing and and we are all part of it and we are made of the stars and we are god right and in, in doing so, they actually become fools. And here's the foolishness. By cha they change the glory of the incorruptible God, who, does, who by the way, is uh, not, we, we're not made to make an image after him, right? Because he's far beyond our ability to understand. Um, but they change the glory into an image made like a corruptible man, to birds, four-feeted beasts, and creeping things. So the pagans developed gods that were lower than God and were of this creation. And not only that, but were lower than man. And if you worship that which is equal to you or below you, the problem is, is that you become less than what you worship. So it's good that we worship a God who's so great and awesome and mighty and wonderful because we are beautifully and wonderfully made by such a being. And to love yourself has very much to do with how much do you treasure the and and how much do you worship the one 
who created you. If you understand how marvelous he is and you say, I'm marvelously made and he made me, then you know that you're noble and worthy and sanctified and holy. Even there's a sanctity of life, even apart from being born again. You're special. God created you. He loves you. He values you. But when you change the glory of uncorruptible God in, in your foolishness and the darkness of your heart and make it like another man or a corruptible man, by the way, not just an, in, an incorruptible, but a, a corruptible man to birds and for and, and see the gods of the pantheons were totally immoral. I mean, when you read the stories of like the Greco-Roman pantheon and stuff, you've got people castrating their fathers and devouring their mothers and raping people and pillaging. Why? Because their gods were made in the image of incorrupt of corruptible man. And see, what that does is it actually makes man lower than that. So not only is their image of God lower than what it should be, but then they themselves become lower because you become less than what you worship. Uh, so when you make it like birds and four-fated beasts and creeping things, snakes and you know scorpions, and you are now debasing yourself to the lowest place. You're debasing humanity and saying there's nothing special about humanity. All right. Well, God created man in his image and gave him dominion over everything. But now you're saying that these creatures rule you. So what is that going to do? You have lost your ability to feel. You've lost your ability to know. You're completely in your, you're lost. And not only that, but God has, because of your foolishness, he's got to show you what this makes you. So he gives you over to uncleanness, to the lust of your own heart, to honor their own bodies between themselves. See, when you honor, dishonor your own body and you go after the lust of your heart, you've given, you've been given up to uncleanness. You are becoming like an animal. You are just a slave to every base desire, right? And not only that, but when you're in this mode, you can't say no to it. These desires come and they rule you and you can't say no to them. That's the sad truth of the a sexually depraved society is that they're slaves to these lusts that they can't control. And when the lust comes, they have to do it, whatever it is, you know, to whatever degree that they've been given over to it. And it's all got to do with the idols in their heart. What, how do they see God and how do they see themselves? If they see themselves as lower than you know, the lowest things on earth, then they're going to be given over to uncleanness and just be robots following whatever lust comes their way because every lust is their God. When you're low, that low, God makes sure you're brought that low. Um, if you're low in your concept of him, then you'll be low in your actions, you know, and they, and, and it goes back to who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who's blessed and forever. So the uncleanness comes from idolatry. If you want to know the root of sexual sins and problems with sexual sins, it's got to do with really your focus on, uh, who God is and what he's done in Christ and knowing the gospel and knowing if you know God truly, you'll come to the gospel and be cleansed by the blood. Um, and that doesn't mean you're going to have all your problems solved. You'll still have flesh, but God will teach you. He'll, he'll bring you back into nobility over time. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. So it's not just uncleanness, but it's vile affections now. And now we're talking about Women changing the natural use of that which is against nature, and likewise men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning lust towards one another. You can see all this. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, that which is meat. Now, what are they receiving in themselves? They're receiving in themselves their, the baseness of their concept of God. That's really what it comes down to. It's a spiritual problem. Um, and even though they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God then gave them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind is a mind that is unable to discern between good and evil and comprehend truth. Um, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with, and then there's this culture of just awfulness, unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. These are people that hate each other, hate God, 
They're despiteful, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents. This is every imagination of their heart has been delivered over to evil. And they know the judgment of God, and those who commit those things are worthy of death. They do the same and have pleasure in them. And you go, yeah, get them, God. Well, remember what I said at the beginning of this, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, but his motive is that people would come to the gospel. And if he delivers people over to this, it's so that he can bring them low, so that he can show them his compassion. That's the intention. Now, eventually, there comes a time where there's going to be no more time because he's got to bring in the kingdom. And we'll see the judgment, you know, that final generation. But as long as it's today, salvation is today. And God's hope is that today people would be saved. And he needs people to bottom out. Remember, these are people who thought they were wise in their own eyes, thought they were noble, and thought they were very smart. And they professed themselves to be wise, but became fools. And it came out of a heart that didn't thank God and glorify God for who he is, but rather chose to go their own way and suppress the truth and unrighteousness and, and rule God out of the picture. And so he delivers them over these things so that they can become so debased that they would eventually cry out. And that's exactly what happened to the prodigal son. The prodigal son needed to go through that experience so that he could taste what the world had for him apart from his father. And he finally got to a point where he said, it's got to be better for my father's servants than it is for me out here. That's what God's hoping, to bring people to their senses through extreme. You know, a lot of times revival will come when the culture has gotten so dark a lot of times people want culture to be moral. You know, no, we don't want the culture to be moral. You almost want the culture to get darker so that the truth can shine that much more brightly. Because against this backdrop of evil that you see it listed here, a righteous person who believes the gospel shines as a luminary. Like he said in Philippians, that you would shine, holding forth the word of life, shining as luminaries in a corrupt and perverted generation. If the generation around you looks as good as you guys do, and everybody's about equal, then the gospel doesn't shine as brightly. But when the culture gets dark, then the lampstand shines brightly. And that's what God's wanting to do, is bring people to the knowledge of the truth. So that's how I'm handling Romans 1. Um, and it's the same way he's going to handle it because you read a list like that, it's hard not to judge the culture and judge people and forget about God, right? What happens? You become a legalist. So what is the next thing he's going to say in Roman 2? You are inexcusable, man, whoever thou art that judgest, for wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself because you who judge do the same things. And now he's going to go against the religious people who think that because they know the law, they are better than the Gentiles. But actually, the law just exposes their hypocrisy. They're that much more under the microscope. So this is a progress where he's first showing that the wrath is revealed against the Gentiles who don't know God, but they do inwardly. Then against the religious who think they know God because they have the oracles and because they have the law. They're all equally condemned under the law, Gentile or Jew. No matter how bad or good you think you are, every mouth is going to be shut. And then chapter 3 is showing that all of this was so that God's righteousness in Christ could be revealed in the way he deals with sins. And we all have the need for that to happen. Um, okay, talk to you later.